Welcome to Pursuing Quality Long-Term Care, an educational podcast for individuals needing long-term care and their families. Join us as we talk with national experts and advocates about strategies you can use in the pursuit of quality long-term care. The U.S. Surgeon General referred to the epidemic of loneliness and social isolation in the United States as a public health crisis with profound consequences and the need to prioritize social connections. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, perhaps no community was more impacted by loneliness and isolation than people living in long-term care. This seclusion led to many emotional, physical, and psychosocial health consequences. In this episode, we speak with Dr. Susan Weary, a nationally recognized keynote speaker and workshop facilitator on depression, dementia, and healthy aging, about the impacts of severe isolation and extreme loneliness many residents have experienced, not just during the pandemic, but before and after. Dr. Weary discusses the value of being heard and ways staff, family members, and friends can work to help combat loneliness in long-term care moving forward. Hi, everyone. I'm Jocelyn Bogdan from Consumer Voice, and I want to thank Dr. Susan Weary for joining us today. We're going to be talking about loneliness and social isolation and the impact that it has on long-term care consumers. And, you know, the topic of loneliness has actually been in the news quite a lot recently with the Surgeon General describing it recently as an epidemic affecting Americans of all ages and really emphasizing the importance and need for social connections. We also know that social isolation, while it's always been there, is something that we've all become a lot more familiar with in recent years as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we know the terrible impact that social isolation had on long-term care consumers throughout the lockdown period of the pandemic. Um, and, And I think a lot of people conflate these two things, loneliness and social isolation, and think of them the same. I actually know before I started doing research into this, I didn't really separate them that much in my head, and I thought they were mostly the same thing. Um, And so I thought, Susan, we could start by talking about the differences between loneliness and social isolation and defining them a bit. Okay, sure thing. And thanks for having me here today. You know, I think that... um, that conflation of social isolation and loneliness in just general conversation is very, very common. But people who study this and who try to really make sense of it and also create antidotes for it or alternatives to it really do want to make sure that we have clear ideas of the difference. So here's, I think, the way you'll find it mostly defined. Social isolation really, or social connection, from a social scientist standpoint, really just refers to the number of people in your social network. That's how simple and concrete it is. And so social isolation is the removal of those social uh, connections and the social network. It's an objective reality, if you will. And so when we talk about social isolation, it's the loss of that, that network or a more limited number of people that you want in that social network than you have. Aloneness, which is not a term that you talked about, is really a choice, right? Many people choose to be alone, and they are neither socially isolated nor lonely. And it is important for us to remember that, that these are very distinct um, descriptions. Loneliness, on the other hand, is a subjective sense that is unpleasant of being alone. It is a desire for more social connection and a desire for more authentic connection. So you can be, to put this sort of more simply, you can be quite lonely in a room full of people. And you can be not lonely at all when you're just with one other person or even alone. So it's a subjective, uncomfortable sense of not having um, interconnectedness when you want it. Um, that's really the distinction here, I think. No, that I think that's a really clear way of looking at it, and it makes a lot of sense. And I think in in my brain, when I when I first saw those distinctions and saw the difference between social isolation and loneliness, I really, I, you're right, I didn't really consider the aloneness choice. Um, but when when I when I started thinking about that and digging into some of this research it looks like a lot of the consequences that we're gonna be talking about later today really stem from the loneliness factor. Um, But I did wanna just go back to the social isolation for a minute because we did see so much of that Mm -hmm. happen. The, The physical removal of people I think is a really good description for what we saw happen within the pandemic 
for many people, not just people in long-term care. I mean, many of us, I have a family, I have two kids, so I did not feel socially isolated at all. Mm -hmm. Um, But I know many people, many of my friends who maybe have a spouse but didn't have a house full of children um, or friends who live alone, a lot of people experience to some extent that removal. And I know the internet, and there are different ways people kind of found to stay connected, to kind of avoid the social isolation. But for many people in long-term care, those avenues weren't always there. And so their universes diminished, not just from family and friends who visited them, but also from having the social interactions with each other within their facilities. Um, And so I do wanna just take a minute and talk a little bit about that. And just because I think not all of the consequences people then faced was because of the loneliness, but we also saw real neglect and abuse kind of stem from that, that um, isolation period. So yes, absolutely. You know, the the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic um, was such a, a, I mean, almost unbelievable still to think about such a harsh set of conditions, right? I mean, it really did just as you say, remove people in long term care, not just from family and friends, which was bad enough, but from each other. And even yeah. from the human connection with staff, right? When you are when you are wearing a mask, a face shield, protective personal equipment, this sort of everything about what we usually count on for body language and for human warmth and connection, right, was gone. Um, it reminded me so much of the kind of the no touch period from the AIDS epidemic, which was you know during the early part of of my training. And so I think people in long term care really do and did and will continue to suffer some of the ill effects of both of those, the social isolation itself and the loneliness. You know, although they're different, social isolation certainly creates the conditions in which loneliness is more likely to arise. Social isolation can Uh, creates the conditions in which depression is more likely to arise. It creates the conditions in which people are likely to become more anxious, particularly people in long-term care who are also living with dementia, because the usual cues and information that people come to count on from their environment that they might not even have words for were also lost to them. And so it has a really profound and lasting effect. And so I think if, although we often talk about and should, these harsh conditions and the profoundly negative impact, the flip side of this is what an opportunity for us to learn, right, about the importance of human connection and of social connection. It has created such an opportunity to teach us so much about how to do it better the next time, how to, how to anticipate the negative consequences, not consequences of the social isolation. And also you could see in all of our behaviors, how much we value social connection. That should teach us something, right? Because just as you said, you're lucky, you have family, you have friends, you have your unit that you can rely on each other. For those with that or those without it, how many Zoom weddings, Zoom birthday parties, Zoom graduations did you go to, right? Everything was just like, all right, we can't do it the way we want. How can we do it? You didn't see people saying, oh, well, we'll just live in a cave for three years. No problem. All of our efforts or many of our efforts were in how to maintain that connection. It's a real clue to how important these things are to us. And, you know, again, they're they're really, there's no single group of people, I think, who were more impacted than people living in long-term care. Um, I do also wanna say though, Jocelyn, as a shout out to older people, (laughs) and people with disabilities, but people living in long-term care, interestingly, in surveys that were done, many older adults rose to the occasion in a way that 18 to 34 year olds didn't. Oh, couldn't, interesting. Didn't have the skills for. And so even though depression and anxiety were very high among older adults, 
there is a way in which older adults rolled with it. And so they were not in some ways as impacted by younger people who were like, what hit me? I don't have a roadmap for what do you do when your life is this disrupted? So it's, it's kind of interesting. I, I certainly don't want to minimize the impact because it was awful. Well, and um, no, and I would say that also consider the people who are able to answer the surveys, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you have the people with dementia, the people who don't have, I mean, many people in long-term care don't even have access to a tablet or something on which to answer that. And I think that's where we saw a lot of the problems. I mean, it's it's interesting, and I'm really glad you brought up long-term care residents with dementia because I just, by the virtue of them having dementia, I don't interact with them as much as I do with mm -hmm. many long-term care residents who are um, who are in long-term care usually because of physical disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I've talked to several residents about the social isolation and that time period when things were locked down. And what's interesting is, I think you're right, there, there are many, many residents who talked about how difficult it was and how difficult it continued to be. We talked a couple months ago and in some facilities, while visitation has been going on now for quite a while, when there were outbreaks, even I think three or four months ago, some facilities were still shutting down a lot of different activities. And so if you didn't have visitors, if you didn't have people to come in and see you, you were stuck in your room. I talked to another resident though, who is a bit younger and who has access to Facebook and to Zoom and to all of these things. Um, and she was maybe lonely in the same way everyone was just being physically cut off from people, but she talks about all of the things that she did during the pandemic, connecting with her friends over the internet and things like that. So I think you're absolutely right that we were able to see people who did rise to the occasion and do all of that. Um, but I but I also agree with what you said earlier. I think this community was just impacted far more than your average person. And what we saw when families re-entered facilities after that lockdown period was in some places, I, you know, it went beyond just loneliness, but we did see a lot of actual neglect, which is certainly not to say that the staff didn't do what they could, but in many cases where there wasn't enough staff to deal with people who were eating, who used to eat in a communal setting and are now all eating in their rooms, they didn't have the time to help people eat. And so people didn't eat. And so the social isolation also within this community led to many very physical consequences. Um, and with, Without a doubt. I think the two areas that concern me most in that sort of physical dimension, as we look at sort of, you know, whole person health, right, um, is in fact the unintentional weight loss and the yeah. deconditioning. So anybody with a heart condition, right, or anybody with congestive heart failure or anybody with, and this is many, many older people with balance or mobility issues, they really lost a lot yeah. of strength and balance just from not being able to walk around. And, you right. know, Here's the thing that I think about when I try to think about well, what can we do differently next time, we will certainly have to adjust our social isolation policies, but even as a simple matter of um, making sure that people maintain their level of physical function. There's no reason that one at a time people couldn't have been walking the hallways and right. just having, you know, sort of regular physical restorative kind of interventions. And I truly appreciate that how, how limited staffing was during those times. But another policy change that might happen is that we have what came to be known as compassionate visitors or something like that, where people with a little extra training chaplains, for example, people from the community could go in and take people for a walk outside or up and down the hall, whatever. In other words, the I totally get the infection control. But as we learned more, we had opportunities to be more creative, to avoid some of those really uh, um, impactful physical um, assaults, I think, on on people, and um, and I do hope that we've learned um, learned that particular lesson.
No, I, I agree. And I think, you know, at Consumer Voice, I mean, we, as many people, are very much pushing for higher staffing. Um, and also, like you said, to, to ensure that it doesn't happen again in the same way, that we never lock people out of facilities in the same way because of all the consequences, because of the excess deaths. Um, you were talking about mobility. I remember talking to someone during that lockdown period who came to see their mother for window visits, and their mom used to come to the window it got to the point where she couldn't even sit up in bed. So they couldn't see her when they came to the window mm -hmm. because she had lost so much mobility. So there, there, there was a lot of that. Um, and it was, it was, I don't know, it was a really hard time for a lot of people. And I think, like you said, we're, we're coming out of it a little bit in terms of the isolation, but it's, it's still there. And there are still many residents who I think feel socially isolated um, in many ways, but I want to switch back a little bit to the loneliness aspect um, mm -hmm. and talk a little bit about the consequences from that. But also you and I have spoken before and you mentioned when we talked that there are different ways to be lonely. Um, and I think that's something that we also saw within the pandemic, the ways that people felt cut off from people. Um, so can we talk a little bit about that? Like, I think there were three different ways um, that people can experience loneliness or three different, different forms of loneliness that people experience. Yeah, so, you know, I think um, I'm, I, I don't remember exactly what we said before, but, uh, but let's sure. talk about um, the ways that people can be lonely. Let's talk about the way of being lonely in a crowded room. Let's talk about being lonely, an individual sense of, of, of loneliness, a subjective sense of loneliness arises, I think, when the person, when a person feels not seen, not heard, not understood, and not a person in the way that we usually think about person-centered care or person-directed care. In other words, who am I as a person living in long-term care? And so there's this, this really strong way of feeling lonely that nobody here knows me, right. knows my likes, my dislikes, my preferences, my choices, or just knows my story or wants to hear my story. So you can be surrounded by a bunch of people, but that, that kind of uh, loneliness of the self, if you will, of not being seen, heard, appreciated, or known. It's something, something like that. I think that there is also a kind of loneliness um, for people who um, lose an attachment, if you will, or feel lonely when cut off from their usual community and their community's rituals. You know, that um, I think that people feel quite lonely when they don't have access to, let's say, I'm most familiar with the Catholic, some Catholic rituals. And for many people, receiving the Eucharist or the communion host is a critically important part of their faith. Um, there's an obligation for it, but also a love of it. And so one of the things that was cut off, that people were, that people were cut off from, um, was being able to see a Eucharistic minister or a priest or whomever, somebody who would basically bring the host um, and, uh, and have that ritual. So not only is there a loss of that, um, that right, if you will, or that, that ritual, there is also a, a, a deeper loneliness, I think, of um, the loss of connection to a specific community mm -hmm. um, and a specific community of meaning. Um, and I don't really recall, Jocelyn, what we talked about before for a, a, a third kind of loneliness, but, but perhaps you can add that. But what comes to mind at the moment, um, and I think about this with people who, um, who feel suicidal, um, who have that extreme of loss of connection in the subjective sense, in the lonely sense, and in the, that there is nobody not only who sees, knows, or hears them or knows their story, but who is connected to them at that um, emotional level. And that kind of um, loneliness can lead to a real sense of despair. So um, those are the, the kinds of loneliness that come to mind uh, for me at the moment in terms of the, both the, the kind of um, lonely feeling, the kind of subjective negative sense the sort of the nature of it, but also the intensity and the duration. Right. And you can see in those, um, those sort of different 
qualitatively different states of loneliness, different solutions as well. Right. What do, you, what do you recall from our prior conversation? So I, so I think you mostly hit on what we had talked about. We had talked a little bit about um, being lonely. I, I, I hesitate to use the word forms of loneliness, but when you lose that one person or somebody to whom mm -hmm. you were very attached and they're gone. And then we talked about, I think, different levels of community, the way you just described when you lose your social circle. Um, so like for me, if I lost, you know, my neighborhood or the people around me that I'm used to interacting with um, for, you know, um, and then we also talked about, I think exactly what you described in the end when you were talking about that religious community, but these larger communities that you are a part of where you might not even be with those people physically that often, but you share these traits in common and you share these things in common. And when you're cut off from that, the the loneliness you feel from, from not experiencing that world anymore, really. And so I think you're exactly right that those different issues or different types of loneliness all lead to sort of different, there are different ways to solve them, um, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Um, I feel like I'm rambling a little. Um, the, the one other thing I wanted to mention, though, before we really get into solutions, because I think that's important, um, and you actually just mentioned something that I want to come back to in a second, um, but I do want to talk about some of the physical and health consequences that can arise from loneliness, because I think it's really important to make sure we, we aren't just talking about loneliness not, not just, I should never say just when we talk about something that could lead to depression or something that could lead to these feelings of isolation, but there are actual health consequences. There are other consequences that stem from loneliness. Um, yeah, it's, I think this is why we see the Surgeon General talking about it, right? Yeah. Um, because I'm so, I'm so glad that, that you want to um, unpack this a little bit, because I think that we have a tendency in our culture to be dismissive of emotional suffering. And so there is this tendency to say, well, yeah, everybody gets lonely from time to time, you know, or this is sort of to minimize how uh, much impact uh, loneliness has on a whole person's health. And, and mostly I think it works something like this, you know, the, the data is there that, um, that states of loneliness increase your risk, for example, of heart disease. Go figure, you know, but it's, it's hard in your heart in a way that is more than metaphor. It's not just hard on your heart from a sadness feeling or as though, like you say, as if that weren't enough. Um, but it really uh, does impact one's overall cardiovascular health. Mm -hmm. And I honestly am not sure about the pathophysiology or the pathway for that, but here's what comes to mind. Loneliness is um, both a symptom of and can be a precursor to clinically significant depression. And we know that when a person is clinically depressed or severely lonely, that whatever other medical conditions they have, they become harder to treat and harder to deal with. So if you have diabetes, your sugars get more out of control when you are suffering from loneliness or clinical depression. And they are different things, but they're, but in this way that they are um, very similar in their impact. If you have heart disease, you're more likely actually to die sooner from that heart disease than you would without. And that's really for clinical depression of which loneliness can be a precursor. And I think part of, the, part of this is a cascade phenomenon. People who are in severe states of loneliness or even moderately severe states of loneliness are disinclined, oddly enough, to engage in social activities where they may feel less lonely because their experience of loneliness within a group setting is worse than feeling lonely when they're alone, alone right? So it's like you, you make this effort and you still feel lonely, then it kind of compounds, compounds the issue a little bit. So it, it impacts sleep. And we all know that without adequate sleep, we have complete disruption in the um, immune system. We have complete disruption in the hormonal system that, that impacts not just the immune system, but also our mood and our motivation. And so the impact on sleep can be uh, quite significant. And 
um, I think that uh, just kind of running through in my own mind, the sort of head to toe, heart, mm -hmm. lungs, I don't know of any impact, quite frankly, on the respiratory system, but certainly on the GI system, the heart system, the diabetes, it, it's, it has profound physical effects. Right. And the other thing I would say about that, you know, when I think about things over a lifespan, I think about cascade effects, so that we know, for example, about dementia, that there are some predictable um, uh, risk factors from lifestyle choices. You know, forget gene, forget your genetics and forget those kinds of risks. Just looking at lifestyle, we know that uncontrolled high blood pressure, which can be impacted by loneliness, mm -hmm is a risk factor for dementia. We know that people with obesity have a risk factor for dementia. Obesity itself is a risk factor. And it's not uncommon. One habit for people feeling lonely is to eat more, exercise right. less than they might have before. So you've got a cascade there. We know that depression for which loneliness is a risk factor. Depression is a risk factor for developing dementia. And then I've already mentioned diabetes. And what I think we sometimes forget, because we have a tendency to, um, you know, to look at these states, is to forget that those states of being, the sort of lonely now means health risk tomorrow. Right. That it is this evolution of impact, probably mediated in, in, largely through our immune and hormonal systems. But um, uh, that's one way that I would help people understand why loneliness is more than just the, or, or why we are so concerned is that it's more than just a subjective loss of well-being. It has real health impact. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the way you walked through that, because even for me, when I've seen the list of sort of, you know, strokes and high blood pressure and dementia, and you see the list of what loneliness can lead to, it it makes a lot of sense the way you describe it. You know, these aren't just sort of alarmist notions that these things right. can happen. It's like these are actual consequences that do happen because of what is going on with you. Um, and so that does bring me back to how how we can solve this or mitigate it. Um, and, you know, when you were talking earlier about experiencing loneliness just because you feel like you are unseen or unheard, um, it took me back to a conversation I had with residents maybe six months ago on this topic um, where when I asked them, you know, well, you know, for residents who are lonely, what what do you think we need to do? Like, what, what would your um, suggestions be? The residents who I talked to, every one of them said, we need people to listen to us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so I, I think it's interesting because I think that that probably is the top. I mean, I want to talk about different things that we can do, but I think really having people there to talk to, to hear them and to make people feel like they are the people that they are um, is one of the top things that everyone can do um, when dealing with loneliness with anyone. But I think particularly, again, like you said, people in long-term care, people who you know, feel, I think, a race to some extent once you enter a facility and you're fighting to keep your rights and to do the things you want to do and you feel this loss of autonomy. Um, but let's talk about other things, other ways that families and friends and staff can help people who are in long-term care who are dealing with loneliness. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how much better I can say it than you just <laughs> did, and that is to listen. Yeah, to take time to listen and taking time to listen doesn't mean taking an hour. You know, it takes five minutes. It takes three minutes. It takes two minutes to pause, to look at, to listen to a resident and to say, tell me one good thing that's happened today. Just one. Wish I had more time to talk. I don't right now, but thanks for sharing that. On my way back, I'll tell you something good that happened to me. In other words, we have got to get past our ideas in long-term care that everything is dependent on having lots more time. Right. What we really are looking to do is to humanize every single interaction, that every interaction should end whether it's one minute or one hour, it should end with that resident 
feeling like that person just saw them and heard them. Then that's really, really step one. And we, of course, have been talking about this for years in culture change, mm -hmm. you know, that it's changing this whole culture to one that is relational and less transactional. And that's, that was one of the biggest challenges or is, is this throwback to a transactional institutional way of interacting with people, getting tasks done, as opposed to having Mary have a good day, you know, as a sort right. of, it's just, it's such a different headset. Anyway, so I think revisiting some of our very basic culture change principles about, <laughs> about it's the person um, is one place to start. Secondly, is to creating those processes and those structures in which residents have even more of a voice. So right. things like resident councils, things like family councils, things like suggestion boxes, things like obviously the ombudsman visiting on a regular basis, which they do, things like connecting with people um, who perhaps typically are outside the, um, the usual nursing home, who are other points of social connection and to start becoming more creative about that. So for example, in one of, one of the, um, one of the nursing homes that I visit, I actually just had a, a, a so I visit a particular nursing home just up the road from me. We have a drop-in group and um, it, it lasts for just 20 minutes, sometimes a half an hour. And it really is just that any residents can drop in and join our support group. It was oh, nice. set up by the long-term care ombudsman in, in the state of Maine. Anyway, so I just go there and, and really that's all I do is listen. And the staff who observe residents interacting with me think that it has something to do with my being a psychiatrist. And they say, oh, wow, I wish we had more psychiatrists. And I say, you don't need a psychiatrist. I want you to see what I do. All I do is listen. And it's not just that I have active listening skills. I'm simply, really simply interested in what people have to say. And within two minutes of a conversation, people are talking about somebody that they've lost. They're talking about the death of a child five years ago, five days ago, 15 years ago, it doesn't really matter. But they're talking about things that are really on their minds. And, and I honestly don't believe it's through any special skill of mine. So, so is it great to have somebody from the outside like me who has time to sit and do it? Sure it is, and keep working to get those resources. But in the meantime, every interaction should be a human one. Every interaction should be an opportunity to get to know the person. I think that, um, that I can't also emphasize enough in this post pandemic period, the importance of our um, assisting residents have a restoration of some rituals, and particularly right. around mourning and around loss, because when during my support groups, this is something that comes up over and over when I say lots of things were hard, what was hardest for you? I can't tell you for how many people it was the death of a fellow resident from COVID or not from COVID that was hard enough, but they weren't able to do the things they used to do. They didn't have their celebrations of life. They weren't able to see the family to say, I knew your mother and I want you to know this is what she meant to me. Their inability to give back to families has been a profound loss. And, um, and I have really taken that to heart and have encouraged the homes here to pay very explicit attention to mourning rituals that were cut off during, um, during the pandemic and to revisit them now. It's just the way we honor our war dead, right? You, it doesn't, they don't have to have just died to say, you know, over the last three years, let's remember by name these people who used to live with us and don't, these staff who used to live with us or work with us and don't, these family members who used to visit here and don't, you know, that, there, that there's something quite conscious and important about that. Otherwise, grieving, I think, will just harden into um, 
you know, some, I don't know, maybe anger for some. Grieving will harden into unresolved grief for others. Um, but mourning rituals are there for a, a reason. And I think this is also what's clued me into um, the profound impact of the loss of culture, the loss of the rituals, the loneliness that surrounds the separation, not just literally from one's community, but from the ways in which there is universal connection. I think it's really interesting you bring that up because again, going back to these conversations that I had with residents about loneliness, um, when I asked them how they felt COVID-19 exacerbated loneliness that may have already been there, two of them in a conversation of maybe five people, both brought up grief and the death of others and how it was handled as what was so difficult for them. And I remember a one woman who I spoke with um, was just saying that, you know, through the pandemic, um, she lost friends and her loneliness has turned into grief because there wasn't really a way to grieve. And another woman I spoke with um, described that in her facility during the pandemic and to this day when someone dies, um, they started closing all the doors when they take the person out of the facility. They just shut all the doors. They don't tell people who the person was. They don't acknowledge it. They never, sorry about that, they never talk about it again. Um, and, you know, I mean, they both, it was just, they were such so profound the way they described this and the impact it had on them. So I, I it's, it's interesting that then this is, this is what you're bringing up because I think that did have an impact. And I would also imagine that as somebody in long-term care, where many people feel like this might be their last home, to see other people treated that way, to see these rituals not happen for other people is devastating, so. You're absolutely right. And I'm not at all surprised it came up in your conversation with residents, it always does. And I think one of the reasons it does is that they really do see themselves in the shoes yes. of, the, of the deceased person. And it's sort of like, who will mourn for me? And the message that was received was no one. Now, yeah. I don't mean for a moment that I don't think staff cared or that people weren't moved by those deaths. Absolutely, they were. But I do think um, we forget the importance of pausing, even right. for one minute. You know, in one minute, it doesn't, uh, doesn't take that long. You know, contrast what you were just saying about closing all the doors with what one of, what one of our veterans homes did, um, which was to modify the honor guard. So it used to be when a veteran died in the veterans home, um, there would be all of the veterans would come out of their rooms, they would stand at salute, they would or stand at attention um, in whatever their branch of the service dictated. Um, there are lots of rituals with that, and they would they would all be present. They could not do that because of the the isolation, but the staff there had the foresight to have everybody in their masks, to have people six feet apart, different ends of the corridor, staff who could be out, and it added maybe what five minutes. And so the the um, stretcher on which the person was being transported passed through this modified honor guard with a promise that when that someday they would have their full arm honors and you know people say well you know won't it be upsetting to see stretcher after stretcher and i say you know that it think about your question is it more upsetting to honor the ritual that's always been there or to have the door closed when everybody knows what it means and right. you're left only with your imagination. You know, it's, um, so yeah, I think, so when we talk about mitigating it, the other thing I wanna say is that um, uh, now that the pandemic is officially over as a pandemic, and now that um, most restrictions are, are um, being um, lifted, we should not assume for a moment that the loneliness issue is resolved. Right. You know, we, we really need to actively check in with people. And you know, there are actually some tools for this. UCLA, I think, has developed a loneliness questionnaire in, in its pursuit of trying to address this, um, this uh, pandemic of loneliness to make sure 
that health professionals are paying attention to it. And so I, I do think that um, asking about it, I think addressing it quite head on is going to be super critical in this period of recovery. Um, and I think that's you, right. you can't lose sight of that. No, I agree. And I think, you know, I, just to go back to as you're describing the grief and the ritual, I think that can also be applied, although that's a unique circumstance, to general rituals, to, to lots of things. I mean, I know one thing that at Consumer Voice that we did every year during the, the three pandemic years was put out a document on visitation during the holidays because mm -hmm. it's so important at certain times of year and everyone celebrates different holidays but you know it's so important to make sure that things are happening for people that they are being included in what they're used to being included in um and i and i think the way you describe just being able i you know i think it's really profound just being able to take that one moment and really listen to someone but i think listening can also encompass hearing different things about that person when you're designing the care plan, making sure that people are involved in activities and doing the things that they that that interest them and that help them, including them, bringing people in they might want to see and, you know, just just making the facility more of their home, which is what it was always designed to be. Um, but anyway, yeah. thank you so much. I think this was really, really helpful and useful. And we just always appreciate your wisdom, if I can use that word. Um, and and I will say that for the people who said, oh, no, you, you do have special skills. I love listening to you talk. So I do think you have a special impact on the residents that you work with. Um, <laughs> okay. But that does not mean that everyone shouldn't go out there and try to do the same. So yes, thank you yes. so much. We really you're, appreciate it. You're so welcome, Jocelyn. And if I may just ask a, or um, yeah, ask a question in closing. Um, people, as I said, learned a lot um, during this pandemic, you know, learned creative ways with Zoom, phone calls, letter writing, window right. visits, whatever. Has Consumer Voice made a, a sort of a compendium of all of I think that you did early on. I don't know if it's been updated. Sort early of, on, we did. That's all right. All of the clever ways that people um, came up with for trying to mitigate it, not fix it, but trying to mitigate it. And um, and I hope that we've collected that wisdom somewhere. I know I know, as I say, that you did in year one. I don't know if anybody has. We get to the end end of this road and look back and say wow, let's collect all the wisdom that we can um, and um, think of all the the ways, the new ways that we came up with to right. stay connected. You know, it's that's really interesting because when we first started talking about this topic, uh, Laurie Smetanka, our executive director and I, we went on a rabbit hole of when, when we were trying to think of solutions, we went on a rabbit hole of technology, of sort of how things are changing and what is happening. Um, and that is that is definitely a direction that we plan to continue to explore. Um, you're right. In the very beginning, I do remember we created sort of like a resource list for people of where what to do and different activities and all of that. But I think you know, that was 2020. The world changes so quickly. I mean, some of the technology we have today, you know, we talk a lot about, um, you know, I, I hate to product place, but you know, I think all the different like Amazon has the little Alexas and Google has Google Home Minis and and the ways that, you know, I've learned that when I travel, whether it's for work or for anything, um, I can drop in and if someone's in a room, I can actually see them in that room and they can see me and I can talk to them just by clicking on my phone. So, I mean, things are changing so rapidly and the ability for some people, it doesn't work, but for other people, those are new and unique ways to stay connected that exist today that did for some people lessen um, some of the issues in the pandemic. So that is definitely an area we're going to continue to explore because it's exciting. Oh, it's so exciting. And we, you know, didn't even touch on technology today. I it, know. And, and no, I we should go back and do it again. We go <laughs> back. Yeah. But um, so I'm glad that you're looking into that. And the other thing I just want to say, and I know you're trying to wrap us up, but I, I really do want to give a shout out to Consumer Voice for the other thing that I think is critically important for mitigating the impact of that particular sense of loneliness of shut off from the community. And that is the way in which you give people um, an opportunity to lend their voices to policy change. Because feeling part of something larger right. than yourself, 
is one of the best antidotes to loneliness. You know, to really feel I am connected to this issue. I am connected to helping solve this problem. My voice is being heard and I am serving as a voice for others in my long-term care community who may not be able to speak up. And so shout out to you for never, ever, ever losing sight of that mission to give voice to residents and then to, to identify residents who can give voice for themselves and other residents as well. So I love the work that you do in that space. And then I just wanted to commend you for it. Thank you. Well, we we appreciate it. And I mean, it is part of what we do. And I think, you know, we often find that residents are much better able to speak for themselves than we are able to speak for them um, because they're experiencing this and they know. And I think their voices are incredibly powerful. Um, Mm -hmm. And so we're very grateful for them for working with us. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good to be with you. Thanks for joining us on Pursuing Quality Long-Term Care. This podcast is a program of the National Consumer Voice for Quality Long-Term Care. Make sure to visit our website, theconsumervoice.org slash pursuingquality, where you can subscribe to the podcast, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and find more information and resources. If you enjoy the podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next episode. (laughs) 